Now, uh, don't, don't let this, I mean, we have great, trans, I mean, everything the Holy Spirit needs to work powerfully in your life, we've got in our English translations of the Bible. But uh, I, I, I spent some time studying, and uh, may, may, maybe it's a little bit useful for us to know to help us understand it a little bo- bit more fully. There's, there, there's three main ideas for, for knowledge in, uh, in, in the New Testament uh, writings. Three words, uh, g- gnosko, gnosis, uh, whichever form, but uh, that starts with a, a, a letter G, if you will, a gamma, and then the second one is, is, is N. And out of that, you might see or get the idea of an English word, Gnostic. And the Gnostics thought they had this great Gnosko. They thought they had special things from God that the others didn't have, and, and Paul talks about that. He has to confront it quite a bit uh, in, uh, in, in Colossians, for uh, example. The, the, this is like a, what they would call an incipient Gnosticism that's happening in the uh, New Testament. Incipient. Wow, that, that is a word. Uh, that's an impressive word. It's, it, it's getting its beginnings. It's a, it's, it, it, it hasn't reached its full yet, but it, it, it's starting this Gnosticism. Uh, bragging about this and that. Paul says, uh, just listening, uh, Colossians 2.18, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen. Why does he do that? Because though this person has special knowledge, he is a Gnostic. And his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with Jesus. He's lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. That's us, the church, the body. We're not talking about a special knowledge here, but that's one, gnosko. Uh, That's one. Another word is oida. That that kind of takes it up a notch. That's where we do have pretty firm knowledge. You can talk about uh, maybe uh, the idea of gnosis, gnosko. Uh, I, I, I read a book about swimming, and now I have knowledge of swimming. Well, with Oida, I'm, I'm going to hop in the water now, and I'm going to overcome some fear. I'm even going to go off perhaps the high dive. They don't have those anymore, but I remember as a kid, you, you, you climb the high dive, especially for the first time, and then you got lines of kids behind you, and there's no backing down. <laughs> And there you are. And it's a lot further down than it looked from when you were on the side of the pool. And I jump in. And I go under the water. And I swim. And I survive. And I swim over to the ladder. And I get back up. And I do it again. I have oida now about swimming. When Paul says that you may know him better, he uses the highest form of knowledge you could possibly have. It's not gnosko, it's not oida, it's epigenosko. This, this is what he speaks, this is what, where he wants you to know God. So in epigenosko, I, I, you know, oida's up there too, it, it, it really is. But maybe with epigenosko, maybe now I become a lifeguard. And I can jump in and save somebody else now from drowning. And if he was underwater or she too long, I can actually get him out and do a little chest compressions, mouth-to-mouth, CPR, whatever, and bring him back to life. I have epigenosco now about swimming. And this is the way God wants us to experience God. To, to, To look at the book and grow in some knowledge, but then to have experiential knowledge of this awesome God and what it is to walk with him and swim with him, if you will. This is that you may know him better at the end of verse 18. That is epigenosco. 